Hi, and welcome once again to Atlantic Filmmakers. I'm Scott Squires, and today joining us on the program is filmmaker Paul Kimball. Paul, a familiar face was here at uh, East Link TV. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me back for the third straight season. Well, you know, when you have a lucky charm, you run with it, right? It's, it's, it's uh, like sports. It's superstition. So we thought to keep the streak going and to keep the program on the air, we'd have you back on. <laughs> so I'm the rabbit's foot for Atlantic Filmmakers. Nice. You, you are indeed. Now, I know um, uh, your first appearance, we kind of went back and, and took a little walk down memory lane and looked at some of the younger years. But we won't go back so far, but let's uh, maybe talk about what were some of the things that led you to get into film? How did you get into filmmaking? What drew you there? I wasn't good at anything else. <laughs> so um, process of elimination, you know, failed at law, failed at music, um, failed at begging on the street. And that's hard. That <laughs> takes a lot of effort. So I figured filmmaking. I mean, you know, if you can't do any of those other things, you can make films. Um, what, were, what were some of the first doors that opened up for you or what kind of avenues did you take to maybe get that opportunity? Did you like help out some buddies with films or did you just pick up a camera, do something yourself? What were some of the first things? I like how you rolled through that as if that was a serious answer. You just said, yeah, we're just going to move on. Um, actually, I backed into it. I was in the music industry and uh, I kid you not, my, my band finally broke up in the late 90s and I had a law degree so I was bouncing around looking for a job. And a friend of mine who worked with the Barrister Society had gone to law school with the vice president of legal at Salter Street Films. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And she said, oh, well, they're looking for uh, somebody with a law degree to come in and work as a consultant on specialty channel applications. And I said, uh, sure, I need work at the moment. So my first job was actually, I knew nothing about the film industry other than I watched films and television. Um, and a guy named Claude Gallipo uh, and I were the two guys who designed their specialty channel applications, one of which became the Independent Film Channel. So wow. I'm the proud great uncle of the IFC, I think, <laughs> or something like that. And um, then I was finished. You know, it's like, okay, thanks. Hey, if we ever need you, you know, maybe we'll call you back. Great, goodbye. And then I was trying to figure out what to do. Long story short, that vice president of Salter called me up one day several months later and said, Phil, um, what is now Film Nova Scotia, what was then the Nova Scotia Film Development Corporation, is looking for a lawyer to be their new program administrator. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I <laughs> applied and got the job and spent a year giving money out to people like me. And then after that, I uh, decided, well, if those people can do it, um, I mean, really, that guy and that guy and that guy, uh, then clearly I can do it. So, uh, it, and it allowed me to go back into the private sector and be, do what I did in the music industry, what I've always wanted to do, which is try and be creative. Now, it's funny, I've talked to a few people about uh, social networking and, and how social networking seems to have increased uh, the number of volunteers or helpers or whatever that somebody making a film, you know, hey, I need background actors, Facebook post, away right. you go. The other side of that is that you get to know uh, a little something, be that super intensely real or kind of what you see, but being on Facebook, I have you as a Facebook friend, we have each other, you get to know a few things about somebody, and you mentioned your music industry and your, in your time with music. Music seems to play a very huge part of your life even today. Uh, what was it? Why did you not, even though the band broke up, why didn't you stay with music? You know, was it, was it because you wanted to go elsewhere or, you know, what led you to not stay with music, I guess? It's this moment where I start to cry. <laughs> no. um, you and Barbara Walters. Uh, I, I've, I often tell people, I say, uh, music was the girl that I loved. Uh, film was a girl that I married, and Law is the jealous ex-mistress that I never <laughs> talk to anymore, or the bitter ex-wife. It depends on who yeah. I'm talking to. Um, there's no question that uh, I love filmmaking. I really do. It's, it's, it's a fantastic career, and I, I enjoy making films. It's been great. However, there's nothing. It's why a lot of people in the film industry, actors, even filmmakers, gravitate towards music, because when my film screens on television or on a big screen in an audience, it's fantastic, but it's not the same as standing up um, in front of a crowd of five people or 500 people, I played to both, and, and playing music. There's just that performing aspect is missing if you're a film producer, director, writer. Uh, I actually feel a, a great kinship with actors um, because having been a musician, a performer, I understand, I think, actors better than somebody. I might not understand acting, but I understand them as people, what they go through. Um, their, their nervousness of performing, what they get out of it. Uh, I can relate to them as people because I used to be one, not an actor, but a, a performer. Right. And I think there's, whether you're a, you could be a football player, frankly. As when you're on that stage in front of somebody, 
it's just different than being behind the camera or being the sound guy at a concert, all of which is terribly important. You can't do films without directors and writers. You can't do um, shows. Well, you can. We did. But you really should have a good sound man um, and producers and things. But at the end of the day, it comes down to performance. And good films can be, I mean, we were a good band. We would do gigs that were lousy because of a bad sound guy. You know, just we sound great to ourselves here, but if it's going out and it doesn't sound good, it doesn't matter how good your music is. Check out some of the old Beatles shows at Shea Stadium where you can't even hear what they're playing. Um, and the same thing's true with film. You can have a lousy film, but if it's got a good actor, a good performance in it, it can raise it up and make it worth seeing. And you can have really great actors in complete dreck. Nicolas Cage pops to mind. I mean, he, the Wicker Man remake, that would be my the worst. Ugh. The man has an Oscar. What's he doing? But he's, in, he's a good actor. He's just in one of the worst films made in the last 15 or 20 years. And there's nothing he can do about it. And so you, you get that understanding that it, it's all part of a team effort. But you understand how the performance aspect of it works, too. Um, that these people are relying on you and that you're relying on them. And so, you know, it really is a team kind of thing. Well, I think one of the neat things uh, that you do with Facebook is uh, your song du jour. Oh, yeah. I enjoy that very much. But if you had to uh, maybe say that there's one main genre of music that you enjoy, because you, you seem to have a pretty eclectic uh, love for music, but it, is there one style of music that you kind of tend to gravitate to? Um, well, I did two seasons of a television show about classical music for Bravo a few years ago. I love classical music. Um, I mean, there's many different periods, but uh, pop. You know, I'm a Paul McCartney, uh, play it at my funeral. And uh, at the wake, play 80s music like the Smiths and U2 and early REM and that kind of stuff. So there's, and there's no question, that's what we played, that's what I wrote in the 90s. The problem was, to answer your earlier question, why I didn't continue with it, I was 10 years too late. The kind of music that I was playing was very popular in the 80s. You know, I was influenced by the bands I grew up with, the Smiths, um, Joy Division, uh, U2, REM, and the Beatles earlier. And in the 90s, uh, it just jumped the shark and everybody decided to be really depressing <laughs> and suicidal. So it was grunge. And, you know, if you liked grunge, well, you probably have a severely screwed up life right now because it was, it was horrible. It was a wasteland. The 70s were a wasteland of music for disco and the 90s were a wasteland of music for, for the lack of musicality. So we were playing in a city where there were bands like, you know, so what? What do I care? Eric's Trip and all these bands that had, frankly, as far as I could tell, no real musical talent and they just droned on and on and they whined about their lives. And I thought, well, what fun is that? So eventually when the band finally broke up, I thought about, you know, continuing on. But I said, I'm just tired. I'm tired of playing music. Uh, I think my shot has passed, um, literally, because I turned down an EMI recording contract once. That was probably the shot. And I said, you know, it's time to go do something else. We are going to bounce around a little bit because, you know, you're somewhat of a renaissance man. You've done a lot of different things. You've worn a lot of different hats, although you're not wearing one today, I see. No hat today. I, I think first time on the show that you haven't. I've accepted who I am. <laughs> oh, so have we, and that's why we have you back. Uh, so you had this, this stint kind of, you know, doing the uh, specialty channel contracts and things like that. But what kind of was a pivotal moment? Uh, you know, okay, music's behind you. Law's kind of not out there anymore. Mm. What was that moment where it was like, oh, you know what? film. That's, that's where I'm going. Um, I think it's when I walked into the bank machine and pulled it out and took a look at the balance and it said $1.74 and I went, well, I got to do something. Um, it's, <laughs> sorry, that's not even funny. It's, it's true, <laughs> but it's not funny. It, it, it's just a continuation. Like I could drop film tomorrow. People ask me, like, what are your next projects? Well, here I'm working on this and this and this and this and I could easily walk away and do something else because for me, I, and again, for funding agencies or distributors who are listening, I still want your money and to do work. But it, I'm not, I've never been tied down to a particular gig. I sp yeah. still speak like a musician. For me, it's about creating. You could be a lawyer and be very creative. I did. I did a few cases when I was articling, you know, your argument. It's all about creating. And at the end of the day, telling a story. I don't want to tell you the stories we were telling in court because they probably weren't true. Um, but that's what a defense attorney does. But music, film, telling stories. Uh, if somebody was to give me money or if I could make money writing travel books, I would happily leave tomorrow and spend a year or two writing a travel book about Eastern Europe or something. But you're, so whatever allows you to create and tell stories. And at the moment, and for the last 10 years, it's been filmmaking. And for the foreseeable future, I think it's filmmaking too. Well, we're going to talk more about your filmmaking. We're going to do that with Paul Kimball right after this.